Hi, this is Alistair Jenks of the No Cellarcast Apple Podcast, hosted at podfeet.com, a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Sunday, the 28th of January, 2023, and this is show number 925. In this week's show, you'll hear my third and so far last installment of my Stream Deck series, where I descend further into my madness, plus a contribution from Stephen Getz on how he abandoned the Adobe subscription train and ended up on the Adobe subscription train. But first, Bruce from Tennessee joins us again to talk Finder and Terminal and how to make them play well together. Hi, this is Bruce from Tennessee, also known as Use the Data, with a tip for working with the Finder and Terminal. The problem to be solved is that when working with files, I find some operations to be easier in the Finder and others to be easier in the Terminal. And there are times where I need a Terminal window open to the same directory as my current Finder window. There are also times when working in an existing Terminal window where I want to either have a Finder window open up in that same directory or get my terminal window into the same directory as an existing Finder window. As Allison reminded me, we've seen some ways to do part of this from the Finder. As explained in an October 2021 tiny tip, link in the show notes, the path bar in Finder is powerful. And you can use the option click on a folder in the path bar to open a terminal window in that particular directory. So that's one way to solve one of the three cases. But how can I deal with the other two cases? The answer is a bit of shell script work that I'll describe in a minute. But let me first describe the results. So when I'm in a terminal window on my Mac, I can simply type CDF, short for Change Directory to Finder, and that terminal session will now be in the same directory as the frontmost Finder window. Going the other way, I can type F here, short for Finder here, and I get a new Finder window opened up in that same directory as my terminal session. So if that's not useful for you, then feel free to fast forward to the next chapter in the podcast or move along to another blog entry. Now, I've had this capability for a long time, but in Allison's call for some content, it occurred to me to share this with the Nocilla Castaways. The answers come from Brett Terpstra in a blog post that is just under a decade old now and links to both Brett's site and that specific post. I was pretty sure that this had come from Brett and his site, like Allison's, has a great search feature, so finding that post wasn't that hard once I went to go look for it. However, several things have changed about macOS since 2013, and some of those changes affect what we need to do to make this work in a current version of macOS. When Brett wrote his article, macOS used something called Bash as the default shell in the terminal. Starting in 2019 with macOS Catalina 10.15, the default shell is now something called ZSH. For a large fraction of the things that a user might do in the terminal, there's no difference. But if you want to customize your environment, the differences are significant. For more about Bash, ZSH, and other shells, go all the way back to Taming the Terminal Part 1 of N, blank in the show notes. Bart and Allison also provide a lot of information about customizing your terminal environment in Taming the Terminal uh, Parts 13 and 14. Again, links in the show notes. And over in Programming by Stealth, the dynamic duo have also provided great information on these configuration files, managing them, particularly in Episodes 121 and 122. So if you've set up a new user account on a Mac at some point starting with macOS Catalina, you're most likely using ZSH, and Brett's instructions won't work for you. 
If you've carried forward a user account, either with Migration Assistant on a new Mac or because Macs last a long time, and you're running a Mac that came out of the box with something before 10.15 Catalina, you're probably using Bash. You can use Brett's instructions uh, to set up the commands, although I go into a bit more detail in the um, posting. So how do you tell whether you're using the new ZSH or Bash? There's a few different ways to do this, but a simple way that's worked every place I've tried it is to type echo dollar sign number zero in the terminal session, followed by a return. The results will tell you if you're running ZSH or Bash. If it says Bash, just follow Brett's instructions and you're good. Although, like I said, I use a slightly different name than he does for one of the commands. If you're running ZSH, then you need to edit your .z profile file rather than the .bash underscore profile file that Brett describes. And the incantations for my CDF command are slightly different. Bart and Allison describe editing text files like this .bash underscore profile and .z profile from the terminal in Taming the Terminal Part 11 event, link in the show notes, and they use the nano editor. Following that guide, while working on a terminal, you could type nano space tilde slash dot bash underscore profile if you're running bash, or you could type nano space tilde slash dot z profile if you're running zsh. The tilde and slash are there to make sure that you're editing the file that's in your home directory, regardless of what directory you happen to be running at the moment. For bash, you can copy in the lines that I show in the show notes. They've used a slightly different abbreviation for Open a Finder window here than Brett did, and so there's a slight difference from his blog post. If you're running ZSH, then it's a slightly different set of lines, again, shown in the show notes. If you're wondering where to put these lines in the file, just add them to the end, then save the file using Control-O to quit, and then quit Nano with Control-X. Quit the terminal app, and then launch a new terminal window. The CDF and F here commands should now work for you. The way to create my F here command is the same for the two shells, but the syntax to create that CDF command is a bit different. For those who are interested, that CDF command is invoking a bit of Apple script to get the directory for the frontmost file uh, finder window. It's also interesting to me as a command line aficionado as being an example of using all three types of quotes in one line. Bart and Allison go into the two of the three types of quotes in Programming by Stealth, episode 143 of X, link in the show notes. The third type of quote, the so-called backtick, which is above the tab key on my US keyboard, is there to tell the shell to execute this command and give me the results as a string. I hope you found this to be a useful tip. And my thanks to Brett Terpstra for figuring all of this out and posting it on the internet, and to Bart and Allison for their great work in both taming the terminal and programming by stealth. Peace, and may you find beauty in the world around you. Thanks for that contribution, Bruce. I think I'm going to set up those commands for myself, because when I develop scripts to solve a problem, I always end up using both Finder and Terminal. And it is certainly a pain point getting them both to be in the same place, particularly if I am using multiple directories. The only thing that's missing for me is something to remind me to use them. And now it's time for Stream Deck Down the Rabbit Hole, Part 3. At the end of Part 2, I had a really useful set of buttons, many with nice button faces. And I was looking into how to get live information to display on a button. I knew there were plugins that did this for their specific functions, but I could not figure out how I could get my own information shown. I posted a question on the Mac Power Users forums and was pointed to an application called Better Touch Tool, or BTT for short. I'd looked at this software before and even trialed it, but I didn't really see myself using custom gestures on my mouse or trackpad, which were its flagship feature. However, now I was being told it could handle Stream Deck buttons. I checked it out and was amazed at the feature set included in this software. At its core, BTT has many types of triggers, 
in many types of actions, and you can wire these together in any way you can imagine. The triggers include the aforementioned custom gestures, but also keyboard shortcuts, text snippets, Siri remotes, MIDI device controls, a BTT remote app on your phone, the MacBook Pro touch bar, and, as of a recent version, the Stream Deck. Actions include, well, everything. There are 15 different categories with actions like sending a key press to a specific application, a requirement I mentioned in part two, performing a mouse click, hiding an application, running a script, opening a URL, resizing a window, and putting the computer to sleep. In all, there are over 150 defined actions, and while many are very specific, like press F19, some are very flexible, like run a script or send a key to an application. BTT addresses the Stream Deck in one of two ways. You can either install a native Stream Deck plugin, which BTT will then communicate with, or you can quit the Stream Deck software altogether and have BTT completely control the Stream Deck. I dipped my toes in the water with the plugin until I got an idea of what could be achieved, then very quickly went all in with full control. Because I made this leap fairly early in my Stream Deck journey, there may be things I mention here in the context of BTT, which are in fact possible with the native Stream Deck software. The BTT interface is fairly straightforward. Where I disliked the clunkiness of the Stream Deck software, BTT is a lot more obvious to me, though it does have some quirky bugs you will almost certainly have to work around. One is when deleting actions from a trigger. It doesn't seem to like deleting more than one at a time. I must get around to reporting that one. The application is hierarchical in the way it works. On the left is a list of applications. There is a special entry of all which contains triggers and actions that will apply regardless of the currently focused application. Then you can set up triggers that only appear when the named application is focused. A good example of the usefulness of this is having buttons on my Stream Deck to set Finder tags, which only makes sense when Finder is the focused application. On the other hand, my light controls make sense no matter which application has the focus. The next level is the trigger types. There are separate sections for Stream Deck, Touch Bar, Keyboard, Mouse, etc. This makes a lot of sense as the different trigger types have quite different requirements. There is no need, for example, to have an icon for a keyboard shortcut like there is for a Stream Deck button. Next is the groups and top level triggers. I should preface here that I've mostly only worked with Stream Deck and Touch Bar triggers thus far. Groups on the Stream Deck manifest as a button, which, when pressed, opens up a whole new set of buttons. I have all my light controls in a group, for example. The first action to set up a Stream Deck button is to add a trigger, which, broadly speaking, represents a single button. You then get to configure the button, including some rules for when it will appear, such as based on modifier keys being held down or only on certain Stream Deck devices if you have more than one. You can also position the button explicitly or leave it to BTT to flow into an available spot on the device. The other aspect to buttons is their appearance. Delightfully, BTT has built-in support for SF symbols, so you can easily create decent looking buttons with very little work. You can also put regular text on them and there are controls for colours and sizing and positioning of the symbol or text and colour of the background. My preference is to create my own image and this can be very simply dragged into the configuration. There is an oddity in how BTT handles custom button images. It seems like it wants a 96 pixel square image by default. However, I have conclusively proven that my actual Stream Deck buttons are 72 pixels square. I just create my buttons at 96 pixels and drag them in and it all seems to work. So it's not a problem as such unless you're trying to be pixel perfect. With basic configuration and appearance set, the real fun begins, adding the actions. Unlike Stream Deck's clunky multi-action action, BTT expects you to add multiple actions. My longest one to date has 26 actions. Adding actions is fairly straightforward, although another bug rears its head here. When you add the first action, the application jumps back to the top level of its hierarchy, so you do not immediately get to edit your action. If you're in a group, this is quite disconcerting as you're taken back out of the group. 
It's easy to just go back into the action, but there are a few paper cut bugs like this. As soon as you have configured any triggers and actions, they are live. Though with groups it seems you have to exit the group and return to see new buttons or new imagery on existing buttons. So I have described a greatly expanded, if somewhat buggy, version of the native Stream Deck software. Is that worth the price of BTT? I think so, because it has a much wider array of capabilities for the Stream Deck and, even with the bugs, it's easier to build up complex action sequences and also to have your buttons adapt to the current environment. Then you can add in all the other capabilities of the software. I have a touch bar equipped MacBook Pro. I've never been against the touch bar, but neither had I really made much use of it until I got BTT. Now I have a battery percentage and charge time indication. The latest readings from my personal weather station, which opens my Weather Underground webpage when tapped. A list of ejectable drives, which ejects those drives when tapped. And an indicator of current Bluetooth status, which toggles Bluetooth on or off when tapped. For me, the main thing BTT has enabled is total nerdery. In part one, I described how I set the lights in my study for my nights on call. That process has changed a few times and currently does this. One, turn off the canvas light panels. Two, set all of the room lights to bright green for four seconds. Three, set all of the room lights to bright orange for four seconds. Four, Set all of the room lights to bright red for 4 seconds. 5. Drop the brightness of the room lights to 10%. 6. Set my max screen brightness to 10%. And 7. Set the Stream Deck brightness to 10%. This takes a total of 26 steps, mostly calling a shell script I developed as a wrapper for very long home control URLs. My current Stream Deck configurations include the lighting group, with five buttons for room light control, five to set scenes on the canvas, and four to set the canvas brightness to fixed levels, including off. The Microsoft Teams group with nine buttons. A laptop battery level indication. This button doesn't do anything, but its appearance is set by a shell script, so it shows me the current battery percentage. Seven finder tag buttons, six colors and a clear, that appear only when finder is focused. These run an Apple script, which in turn calls a shell script. A group of 10 buttons that appear when DxO Photolab is focused, which give access to commonly used tools. An additional group of 8 buttons for Photolab for its local adjustment mode. A button for the Citrix Viewer application that presses a special key to invoke the Windows Insert key, which is not present on Mac keyboards. And a button for Terminal that enters the SSH command to my web server. That's 51 buttons in total, not counting the group buttons, using a variety of action types. I think I've only just begun. Next, Allison sneaks in again for a chat with Stephen Getz about Stephen's journey through software for his photography. Well, hey, I'd like to interrupt your regularly scheduled programming here. This is Allison, and I want to do this to introduce the NoSilicast audience to one of my best friends I have never met, Stephen Getz. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Hello. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. So you have heard Stephen uh, in a review or more than one that he has done over the years, but this is the first time he and I have taken the time out to actually have a conversation. And if you've listened to the show for any length of time, you know that I get advice and help from Stephen all the time. He lives in Ontario, Canada, and I live in California, which is why we've never met. But in a very odd turn of events, my daughter Lindsay and her husband Nolan were vacationing near where Stephen lives, so the three of them met up for a beer, and I am still jealous that you got to meet them, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, that that was seems like forever ago because it was the before times. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, they got to meet you and I didn't. It doesn't seem fair. Well, no. in any case, I asked Stephen to come on the show to talk about his ongoing personal struggles with his relationship with Adobe for photography. He's a pretty serious photography guy shooting with a big girl Canon DSLR. So um, it, it, it's a funny conversation, I think, because it, it has to do with trying to divorce himself from Adobe and yet coming back over and over again. So uh, can you can you start at the beginning of the story? Uh, like, why did you leave Adobe Lightroom? What is a, Adobe Lightroom? What is it used for? Start at the beginning of the story. So I guess I'll start out with Lightroom. 
And uh, Lightroom is a software for organizing and editing and tagging and sharing your digital photos. Um, and it's been around for a very long time. I started out using iPhoto back in the G4 I'm, iMac day. And then yeah. I moved on to Aperture, which was a more pro tool. And I loved Aperture because it would organize my library and it had the really good editing tools. And uh, it just works the way I work. But yeah, you could uh, actually do like brush level editing, like you could brush in a, a, a burn or, or, a, or a color change and things, right? Yeah, and the tools worked how I liked, wanted them to work. They, the, when I moved the, the adjustments, like the black and the, the highlights and shadows, they moved how I expected them to move, if that makes any sense. But yeah, yeah. Um, Aperture abandoned that product, so I had to, or Apple, Apple abandoned, abandoned Aperture. Aperture. <laughs> so I had to right. find... An alternative. So back then, this is probably five years ago, maybe longer. I moved to Lightroom, Adobe Lightroom, and it was, it was, it was, a, it was a tool that worked really well. It organized photos very well, and tagging worked the way you would expect it to work. Um, and the tools were at, were at the time state of the art tools for uh, noise and editing and changing how your fo- raw processing. I okay. mostly use I use Lightroom for almost entirely raw photos from my Canon DSLR, and okay. um, anything like from my iPhone, I just use Photos Apple Photos for. So oh, interesting. I, I keep those okay. two lives separate. Um, but uh, so App or Lightroom didn't. I wasn't as happy with Lightroom as I was with Aperture, but Aperture was dead, and I've always learned that once the product dies, to move on from it. Instead of trying to make, instead of trying to make it work for me longer than it is intended to, if that makes sense. Right, like like Dan Morin said, quit it before it quits you. Yeah, well, especially with Apple, because once they abandon things, they uh they'll update the operating system, and then you're like doing like hacks to try just to get it to work with the newest version of the operating system. So the other problem I, is if you if you do it late. I found that you you end up being one of those people asking a question about how to migrate when everybody's forgotten how to migrate. Oh, exactly. Right. And all the all the information you'll find is two years old and it, right. they've changed how it, it works or because they don't need to worry about that. Cause <laughs> but um, so I moved on to Lightroom and Lightroom met my needs. But the, the niggles with Lightroom for me are the subscription. They're... Uh, a subscription model so you have to pay monthly for lightroom and can you pay for just lightroom so you can but it's actually it's more makes more sense to pay for they have packages for the creative cloud and it goes mm-hmm. all the way up from every single piece of software they make in one subscription price to uh to like individual software programs but i i'm i use the photography bundle which there's different versions of it that give you online storage, which I don't use. Um, but the plan I have, you get uh, what they call now Lightroom Classic, and you get Lightroom, which works, which is on the iPad and on Mac OS and Windows and all the operating systems you could think of. I just use Lightroom Classic. I don't use what they would call Lightroom now. Um, Interesting. So you have light. You get Lightroom Classic and Lightroom. Correct. Yeah. And Lightroom <laughs> works more, it's better. It's designed to use on the iPad. So it works differently than Lightroom Classic, which is more mouse oriented, I guess. Oh, okay. Is okay. how I would describe it. Okay. Um, so you don't, so, you don't rent Photoshop. Oh, so it does have Photoshop too. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. I don't use it very often. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I use, I use Affinity Photo if I'm going that nitty gritty, but okay. um, anyway. Uh, but yeah, it does light. Or, so it's it's photo, it's Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, and Photoshop in a photography bundle, and it's like uh, twelve dollars Canadian a month. I think okay. is what the subscription is right now. And if you buy at the right time, you can get a deal on it, and it can be cheaper or more expensive if it's not the right time. But um, <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I don't remember exactly how I found a, a product. This company called DXO, which I've read their camera reviews for a very long time because they they take cameras and they like review the sensors and give them a, like a, a score wait a minute is that that's not the same yeah that's it is. not dp review no it's, dp it's review a is a okay. website but dxo does okay. um 
lab oh, testing. Oh, they're super pi pixel peepee -pee people, yes, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. So I've heard I've heard of DxO before, and um, they make software for um, they make software for processing raw photographs. And so Graham Shepard just talked to, to us about DxO something recently, and yeah, Alistair has so talked I about think that's DxO pure, something. I think what he uses is pure raw. I think, and that is. That is what that is their engine for um, rendering raw files. Okay. And the software that um, I use is Photolab, which is by DxO, and that matches their rendering with a library module, so you can organize and edit your photos at the same time. Okay, so it's a Lightroom equivalent. Yeah, or or Photos, Apple Photos, the the okay. uh, the Mac app. Just think of it as a more just like Aperture, a more pro version of that. Okay, so the main reason that you looked at DxO, um, sorry, Photolab, was because you were tired of paying the, the subscription. Was there any other reason? Um, I thought I always felt that Lightroom, the editing was a little clunky on it, um, and this was before they they've they've added a lot of features since I had switched away a couple of years ago. So okay. we'll go back to that later, but. Um, I just the editing was just clunky feeling. It just felt it felt felt more like a Windows piece of software that I was running on my Mac, because oh, interesting. it's it's well it's multi platform, right? So um, let me interrupt really quickly here uh, because we haven't necessarily defined for non photographers that that raw photos basically contain more information. They they uh, I'm not going to get into depth and and that sort of thing, but they contain more information that you can do more editing to get higher dynamic range within your photos, and then you can compress them down into a JPEG, what we would standard see, or like like HEIC sort of <laughs> on the uh, on the iPhone. But it, it's basically just more information, big files. You edit, you can uh, do a lot more to edit them, bring out shadows, uh, bring down brightness, and and get a better picture. Just wanted exactly. to interlude yeah. that. So I, okay. found, I ran into uh, DxO Photolab. It was Photolab 4 at the time. And it was probably around, I want to say it was the fall. It was in the fall. Because I, I tried the trial of Photolab 4, and I ended up finding Photolab 5 on sale, and I purchased Photolab 5. Because it was, oh, cool. if you wait till it's on sale, you can get it like for 70 US dollars. for oh, wow. And it's, it's no subscription, so you can use it forever for that $70. So that was less than a year of like, so I thought, you know what? I'll try it for a year and see how I like it. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. Because I, I, I saw that um, the it makes nicer looking, it renders the photos nicer, the more, to me anyway, the with less work, if that makes sense. Um, like you have to do, it's a lot less fiddly to get the pictures to look the way you want or the way I like them anyway. Everyone has their own preferences, but, um, but it's got some, it's it's got some advantages over Lightroom. Uh like it's no subscription. Uh they update it all the time. Uh so they're doing bug fixes and adding features in the year after you've bought it. So it a lot of software once you buy it, they don't update it. But Photolab is very good at tweaking things that don't work properly. So it looks like they do paid up upgrades pretty often they, though. DxO they, Photolab six is out? It comes out about once a year. Okay, and uh, yeah. so you're you get bug fixes, but maybe you're you're tempted by the next one. Correct. Yes. So Which you is... might end up with the same cost that you did if you did Lightroom. Exactly right. Especially if you don't if you just if you don't wait for when it's on sale. Now they put it on sale quite often, but if you're like at the wrong time and then you don't know they do the sales, then you end up paying a lot more for it than you needed to. But yeah, I think it's $139 for the Essential Edition right now. Yeah, and you don't want the Essential, you want the other one. Because it's oh, got... Oh, good grief. You want the higher, the more <laughs> yeah. expensive one? Yeah, oh, but if you cow, buy it on... that's $219. Yeah, so if you buy it on sale, though, you can get it that... the You can get the 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 non... the what I forget what they call it now, but you can get the full package for like $70 or $100, I think. Oh, so, okay, Elite. Yeah, Elite, that's what they call it. Yes. Okay. So, All right. um... But its killer feature to me is it's um, it has very very good lens correction, and that comes from their camera testing. So mm. they, because they test every not just the camera body, they test the camera body with specific lenses, and then they I don't I don't know exactly what the the secret sauce to how they do it, but they have profiles for body and lens together. So this is uh, correcting like for lens distortion on the yes. edges. Yeah, and okay. then and it does. Uh, 
it does sharpening in spots that it knows that lens is um soft <laughs> okay some lenses have like they'll have a spot that at certain uh f-stop and focal length are soft in certain spots in the frame and it wow. it will magically apply sharpening in just the spots that it needs it so it doesn't over sharpen the other spots that's so cool it's very it's very smart their lens correction is very good and it's again it's not just like oh it's because it's a it's a ADD or whatever it's right down to that lens and the camera together okay. so um and it they also have very very good uh noise reduction they call it deep prime and they iterate it probably once a year or two i think it's like deep, deep prime plus or something now okay but, is that so is that a separate package you can buy standalone i think they have a standalone tool cuz they they bought nick i don't know if you remember nick yeah the nick plugins they bought nick and some okay. of the nick stuff shows up in there in in um in photo lab you just don't know that's where it's from uh, okay like yeah. i i recognize controls from the nick plugins that i used to use with lightroom like forever ago okay. but it's it's noise reduction is very good um i, I think it uses ai but everything uses ai, AI, AI now it feels <laughs> like <laughs> steven's had me send him a couple of photos and what he's of, of my own where i know i've done everything i can to fix the noise and he sends it back and i've just been blown away those are that's that's pretty cool so that's something to look at right now 129 dollars for pure raw yeah so pure rod gives you deep prime and the lens correction but without the organizing bit if that makes sense okay um and so you can use it with if you are comfortable with um, photos, but aren't ha Apple photos, but aren't happy with the editing tools, which is I did try photos, but I don't like I can't I can't edit with it. I tried. I, I gave it a really good shake because why buy software if I have if I'm already paying for software? Why not? Right. But I yeah, just couldn't. Yeah. I, now, sadly, they don't support Apple Pro Raw. And they're saying because Pro Raw is not a true raw format. It's an Apple proprietary format. So yeah it has something to do <laughs> with having I'll to use, use apple's uh apple's software to do it and that they don't have that built into there or something okay uh, lightroom does it so i don't know about <laughs> adobe <laughs> adobe is also a lot bigger than dxo so right um, okay so you're happy now you you're in D you're in dxo photo lab you've got this great organizing organizing tool you've got great software tools for editing your photos but yes then you went back yes so i wasn't happy with the uh, I will say DxO still has a lot of work with the organizing uh, tools, part of their mm. tool. Um, it just didn't. It's it's really hard to explain. It just didn't. Um, I just found myself always looking for photos when on Lightroom I could find them a lot easier. Even tagging, uh, tagging was tagging tools are not great in DxO. Again, they're getting better, mm -hmm. and they're a lot. At six, apparently, is a lot better than five, and five was a lot better than four, but. <laughs> I just thought if I before I bought six, I really thought I'm going to give Lightroom another chance because they have a trial. So I thought try the trial. I just find Lightroom's organization more natural uh, to how so I feel work. like you were coming home when you went back. Yeah, I'd, I'd almost did. Yeah, like it. And again, the XO is not bad. And I would definitely recommend it if, if someone wanted to try something other than Lightroom. But it's just it was again, it was like coming home to how it worked. And the same with the editing tool. Again, DxO's tools are very good. They just, I don't know, it's hard to, it, it's just, they work, uh, Lightroom works the way I like it to work, in the yeah, way I would yeah. expect it to work, and in the time I have available to sit down and work on my hobby, uh, Lightroom let me do more in less time. So are you nutty with your tagging the way Alistair is? No, or Alistair I know, has, I'm not, Alistair, <laughs> this massive I don't, architecture. I'm not sure anyone else on earth is as nutty as Alistair is about, <laughs> about the tagging. <laughs> No, I generally just I really tag. hope this plays during Alistair's show so he can do the <laughs> rebuttal. <laughs> I just tag, um, I usually take like the event, like like uh, son's birthday or and the people in it and I, the place because my camera doesn't have a GPS on it. So not all my photos are geotagged. So okay. it might be like Walt Disney World, Jack, uh, uh, Dumbo or something like that. Just so that... <laughs> If I'm looking for something like specific, then I can find it just by typing out Magic Kingdom or Walt Disney World. And I don't worry about it. I, ju I just do that with uh, in photos. I I've started doing a little bit of tagging, but for uh, just a very specific couple of categories. But I, 
uh, I just create an album for the event and I name it with that. And and by the way, folders are not searchable, just so you know, in photos, but album names are. So I create folders by quarter, by year. And then within that, I have albums and I just drag all the photos from, you know, Sienna's birthday, go into, into a folder or into an album. And then... Uh, of course, most of my photos have have geotagging, but you can now in Apple Photos, you can actually add the geotagging. You could select a bunch of photos and say this was at Disney World. Yeah, and I could do that in Lightroom. Just I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I should. I should take more time and do it because you can do it on, when you import them. But mm -hmm. I don't. I I just import them. Maybe it's because I'm too impatient to look at them or something. But <laughs> when you when you say tagging, is that the same as keywords? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because yeah, I knew that's where Alistair had his. In his fact, they probably hierarchy. even use them, call them keywords in here. I just, <laughs> I just call yeah, them tags. I, I always get confused on the difference between the two. When you switched from Lightroom to DxO and back to Lightroom, did it retain all of your keywords? Uh, it does because uh, DxO and Lightroom store a lot of their information in what's called a sidecar file. So it'll be a little file. Uh, both of them leave your files on your on their drive like they're not in a package like photo okay like photos okay not they're in a database like, no so it's it's a like you can move pictures and stuff in and out of them and okay. um so they store all the uh, the keywords and um both of them will store even edits in sidecar files so okay, uh so you always have the original file yes and in fact i'm now running across um, since I moved back to Lightroom and I stopped using Lightroom for a couple of years, there are older files that the edits are still there, even though I like don't even have that old library. I like made a new library, but it's oh, kept, it wow. kept ratings and keywords and even the, the edits, like I can go in and see the, I, I, I redo edits a lot, but I, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I can go in and see the old edit and I had that on that and tweak it a little bit because it's all in the sidecar file. It's not in the library file. That's pretty cool. So this is this is kind of interesting. What I enjoyed about listening to you in, we text chat all the time. We've, we're actually looking at each other in video, which we're pretty sure we may never have done before. Maybe once. Yeah, um, maybe once. But we text chat eight times a day, I think. Um, but what was funny was you, it was almost like you felt dirty going back to Adobe. Well, yeah, because everyone, like, again, it's the subscription model. I really, like, I like the subscription model and I don't like the subscription model. I like the subscription model because I, it allows developers, big ones and small ones, to all keep bringing updates to their software and know that they have a steady income to do that, right? right? Like, and there's a lot of like smaller people that have gone on the subscriptions and they explain why. Like one password, for example, is a good one. Um, and it makes sense to me, right? Because that steady income allows, makes it less of a risk to bring on staff and help you develop your software. Mm -hmm. But, I also like it's also can be depending on the software like for like for me and a lot of other people $30 a month is a lot of money to spend on their like their hobby right I guess what you've learned though by by your experimental uh, path was that it's a fair price because yes, DxO I is doing much of the same kind of work and it's the same price in the end because you have to you essentially have to buy it once a year I and yes and that's to. what I've that's what I've come up. That's what I found because it was when I was looking into buying uh, Photolab Six. I'm like, what's the difference if I'm going to spend a hundred dollars a year on Photolab Six or on Photolab, or am I going to spend a hundred twenty dollars a year on Lightroom? Like twenty dollars is not a big difference over a whole year. So, right. <laughs> you know, like, so that and that's when I'm like, you know what? I'll try Lightroom again because, like, I don't think Photolab Six progressed enough to be worth the for the tools I use, anyway, to, right. to be worth the extra $100. I guess one of the nice things is now you have a little bit of the best of both worlds because you have the subscription for Lightroom where you're more comfortable with the library, but if you ever want to go over and use the noise reduction tools in DxO, you've still got DxO5. Well, what's really nice is DxO does have a plugin for Lightroom where you can round trip photos. So I can, oh. in Lightroom, I can choose a photo. Let's say it's a, it's a photo that's noisy, for example. Mm -hmm. Or had, I used a, a a less good lens, so it has like distortion or something. Mm -hmm. I can send it to to the DxO software and just use the lens correction and the noise reduction, and then it will spit out a DNG file 
back into Lightroom where I can do all the other editing I, I like to do. But uh, so that I get the really good noise reduction and lens correction from uh, Photolab, but then get the tools and the organization I like from Lightroom. Oh, that's great. That's really cool. Well, I don't think you should feel dirty going back to to Lightroom. It sounds like you did a uh, a good experiment. You uh, considered it, and I will try really hard to not mock you for paying them. Wow. Yeah. That, that, I appreciate that. <laughs> Mocking is basically the the central core of our relationship. So that, that's a big statement I'm making there. <laughs> and it goes both ways, right? Tell the people. It goes both ways. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's not. All right. Well, for that, I'm going to wind you up. If people want to talk to you online, uh, what would the best way to do that be? Uh, probably just my Twitter, uh, at Goatman. I'm also on the Slack as... Uh, I don't remember what my name on the Slack is. I looked it is. up. You're Stephen Getz. I'm Stephen Getz on the Slack. There you go. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, he's he's pretty active in there and uh, like all the other no lovely Nocilla castaways. So it's a lot of fun. Well, thanks for coming on. It was it was a treat for me to get to see you and talk to you in real life. Well, as real life as nerds <laughs> believe in anyway. Uh, thanks for having me on. Thank you for that, Stephen and Allison. I would just like to make a few clarifications. DxO's two products share some DNA, but serve very different purposes. Pure RAW is a RAW converter. It does lens and camera corrections and noise reduction. These two features are DxO's secret source. Pure RAW is a drag and drop application. RAW files in and processed images in DNG, TIFF or JPEG format out. There are very few controls over the processing done. Photolab is a full-featured application, like Lightroom Classic or Aperture. It has the same RAW conversion engine as Pure RAW, but you get more control over how it works. Then there are the library and usual processing features as Stephen described. It is worth reiterating that the more expensive Elite Edition is the one you want, because the Essential Edition does not have the best noise reduction technology, amongst other things. Also, Apple Pro RAW isn't really RAW. It is synthesized from multiple lenses and already converted from the sensor data into a full RGB image. It does contain a lot more information than the HEIC files, but DxO's secret source is decoding RAW sensor data. So even if it supported Apple Pro RAW, it'd just be like using Lightroom when it comes to sharpness and noise reduction. My journey in photo processing software has, so far, been... Nothing, Lightroom, Aperture, Lightroom again, Luminar, Photolab, and most recently, Photolab and Lightroom. Keywords are Lightroom's superpower. Stephen called me nuts for my keyword prowess, and who am I to disagree? As an example of why I use Lightroom for keywords, I noted the stats of a recent session. I had 293 photos to which I applied 64 unique keywords, an average of 9 per image, and I did it in only 20 minutes, including defining 3 new keywords. It is worth noting that Lightroom Classic can be used as a photo library manager, including keyword management, for free. If you have any questions about this, hit me up in the PodFeed Slack. Well, that's going to wind things up for this week. If you like the content I created here, please consider checking out my photography and writing at zkarj.me. I'm an active participant in the PodFeet Slack, usually adding fun content to the Delete Me channel. And you can also follow me on Twitter at zkarj. Did you know you can email Alison at alison at podfeet.com anytime you like? If you have a question or suggestion, just send it on over. You can follow her on Twitter at, at podfeet. And you can find her on Mastodon at at podfeet at chaos.social. If you want to join in the conversation, you can join our Slack community at podfeet.com slash slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely Nocella castaways. Remember, everything good starts with podfeet.com. You can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon or with a one-time donation at podfeet.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, you're going to have to wait until Sunday, February 5th, when you can head on over to podfeet.com live 
at 5pm Pacific Time and join the friendly and enthusiastic Lucilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed. <laughs>